another year of transition. Every year is. But this year we leaned into the changes that are happening globally and we're ready to go in 2020. We know that fragile states are still the common denominator behind violent extremism, civil wars, massive migration. We still need to focus on that. But we also know that rising global competition, resurgent Russia and a rise in China need to be grappled with. We have to make investments in fragile states today to avert tomorrow's crisis. I was in Istanbul this fall uh, for a negotiation workshop with 25 Afghan women leaders. We brought experts from the US, Colombia and the Philippines so that they could share lessons learned and best practices from peace processes from other contexts. USIP here in Libya is working with uh, local communities to push peace forward. The final objective is to actually help people come together to build social cohesion. Our goal will be to address those drivers of fragility that give rise to the extremist threat. But we're seeing that those conflicts are complicated by the rise of interstate competition over the last 10 years, we've seen China adopt a much more ambitious and aggressive foreign policy. USIP has been really focused on trying to understand China's policies towards countries in China's backyard, like Myanmar or North Korea, as well as countries a little farther afield, in Africa or Latin America or the Middle East. One of our real strengths is our ability to stay the course on the ground with partners in frontline conflict countries. We've supported workshops and trainings with activists, organizers, and peace builders in Latin America, Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. We managed to bring together people from tribes who haven't sat around one table or in the same room for years now. For nearly 20 years, USIP has put gender at the heart of its work. We know from research that the more gender equality in a society, the less chance of violent conflict. I have been awed and humbled by the women I've met doing courageous work building peace in their communities. But too often, these women remain invisible. In 2020, we will be awarding our first ever Women Building Peace Award. USIP launched the Women Building Peace Award to really recognize the important role that women play in peace processes and in overall peace building. In 2020, peace is possible. It takes action. It takes all of us. My name is Patricia Kim, and it's a real pleasure and honor to be here tonight in Salt Lake City. I'd like to thank uh, the Utah Council for Citizen Diplomacy, Ambassador John Price and Mrs. Price, uh, UCCD Executive Director Felicia Maxwell Barrett, and Ms. Perry uh, Kemick and Westminster College for inviting me to give this lecture on U.S.-China strategic competition, a topic that is increasingly at the forefront of the minds of many policymakers and foreign policy watchers, and it's a challenge that we'll have to grapple with in the coming decades. But before I turn to my lecture, I'd like to start by briefly introducing the U.S. Institute of Peace, where I work um, as part of the China Program team. 
So USIP is a national, nonpartisan, independent institute founded by Congress in 1984 that is dedicated to the proposition that a world without violent conflict is possible, practical, and essential for US global security. Our creation was the result of two decades of work inside and outside of Congress to establish a national institution focused on peace. So starting in the 1950s, this effort was led by veterans from both uh, political parties who had served in World War II and had been deeply affected by this, ex their experiences. They advocated for the creation of an institute that is akin to our four military service academies that would focus on the study, of, uh, study and practice of peace. And then in the 1970s, the efforts accelerated as, as these, as these uh, activists as well as leaders in Congress were spurred on by a grassroots movement across the United States where tens of thousands of US citizens mobilized as part of a campaign for a national peace academy adding momentum to this idea. So then in 1979, President Jimmy Carter appointed a commission to study the possibilities. And then in 1984, uh, the report that was created by Congress was signed into uh, law by President Reagan, which created the US Institute of Peace. Now grounded in this important history, USIP is an institution that body, embodies America's commitment to peace and we are now in our 35th year in 2020 and this core mission uh, in today's world feels much more important than ever. Uh, so as you saw in the video snap, snap, snapshot that we showed, um, USIP basically operates as a think and do tank. Um, and the video, again, gives you a flavor of the type of work that we, that we do, as well as the priorities that we have for 2020. Our staff uh, work in conflict zones at both the community level, as well as with national and regional governments. And we focus very much on connecting top-down as well as bottom-up initiatives together. We also conduct research, we convene policymakers and civil society actors, we conduct training and education, and we generate policy recommendations. Now USIP's China program, where I sit, um, we, we tend to do a little bit more of the traditional think tank work. So we conduct a lot of research to try to understand China's role in various regions around the world. We convene track 1.5 dialogues, which are basically dialogues that have a mix of government officials as well as experts that are not held at the official level so that you can have a bit of a more relaxed and honest conversation. Um, we also work closely with our U.S. government counterparts at the State Department, at the Department of Defense, as well as uh, USAID on various projects. Uh, in other parts of the Asia Center, as you saw in this video, we have colleagues who are working in actual conflict zones at the grassroots roots level. And the Asia Center has uh, offices in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Myanmar. And many of these teams, again, are working with civil society leaders, local governments, and youth groups to advance peace on the ground. Uh, before I start, I want to talk a little bit about ways you can engage. So USIP's mission is directed at preventing and resolving violent conflict overseas. But another important uh, part of our mandate calls on us to serve the American public directly by providing education and information on how conflicts can be resolved without violence and how peace is possible. So we have a dedicated public education team that carries this work forward. They actually sent me here tonight. Um, and so we engage across all 50 states, including here at, uh, in Utah with educators and students. Um, and we, we do this to raise awareness of USIP's works uh, to provide resources and ways to engage. For those of you who are interested in following uh, USIP's work, uh, we, passed, we had flyers in the back table um, where it, it outlines the various ways you can get involved. So I encourage you, if you're interested, to sign up for our email newsletter, follow us on social media, and tune in for webcasts for our live public events. Also, we have a lot of resources if you are an education, educator at all levels, from K through college. And we have all kinds of materials available on USIP.org. Uh, for students out there, as well as lifelong learners, we have something called a global campus, where we offer free courses online on conflict resolution and peace building. And again, all of this is available on our website. 
And finally, if any of you plan to visit Washington, D.C. at any point, we'd love to have you come over and visit our iconic headquarters. Uh, we are located on the National Mall right across from the State Department. So we welcome public visitor uh, groups by appointment on our website. And if you're traveling as an individual, also feel free to reach out and we can see how uh, we can have you come by. Uh, so again, there are flyers in the back if you are interested in, in engaging. And if you have any specific questions or want to be connected to our public education team, I would be happy to do so. So please come uh, chat with me after the lecture. All right, so now we're going to shift gears and turn to the topic of tonight's lecture, strategic competition between the United States and China. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to note that all of my remarks tonight are mine only. They do not represent the official views of USIP, and they're based on my own research and analysis. So ever since the United States uh, national security strategy and national defense strategy stated that great comp power competition is back, and a revisionist China is one of the greatest threats that the United States faces, there's been a growing focus on the topic of strategic competition with China in Washington and around the world. And there are grave concerns about whether we're walking into a new Cold War. <coughs> in the midst of such stark assessments, I believe it's critical that we either exaggerate or underestimate the challenges that are posed by China, and that we try to develop a nuanced picture of what exactly Beijing is trying to do around the world, uh, to understand what this strategic competition actually entails. At the same time, I think it's very important to look for ways to um, continue constructive cooperation with China because cooperation with China will be necessary to solve some of the greatest international uh, challenges that we have in the coming decades, whether it's denuclearizing North Korea, tackling climate change, or reducing poverty around the world. Now, I would start by noting that the United States' greatest challenge in its competition with China is not in the military realm, but really over the hearts and minds of allies and our regional partners, especially as you move further afield from China's borders. China today is no longer a revolutionary communist state that is funding uprisings around the world like it did in the first half of the Cold War. Rather, it's out to win influence, political leverage, and soft power through its economic success story and offerings. China generally sees cultivating economic prowess as its means to rise to the top. And although its military capabilities have significantly improved over the last two de decades, Beijing is less interested, at least thus far, in quickly surpassing the United States to become the world's premier military power or taking on the, uh, the role of global security power <laughs> provider that the United States has played since the end of the Second World War. Instead, China seeks to position itself as an economic partner of choice, and it sees this as its primary way to win friends and influence, not only in its immediate neighborhood, but also as far abroad as in Africa and Latin America. Now, to achieve these objectives, Beijing has employed a variety of means, including a public diplomacy campaign that emphasizes that as China prospers, the world will also prosper. So you may have heard some of these ideas or slogans um, that are connected to this line of argument, such as win-win diplomacy or creating a, co a community of common destiny. So these are some of the favorite phrases that uh, President Xi Jinping likes to use, as well as other Chinese leaders. Now these terms reflect China's efforts to be seen as a productive player and are essentially China's answer to the call to be a responsible stakeholder and to use its power in positive ways. Chinese leaders have also pitched the idea that China is a different kind of great power and that it seeks to practice a new type, new type of international relations in which large and small states treat each other with respect. Now, not many outside Beijing, especially in its immediate neighborhood, find this narrative very convincing. And there's skepticism for good reason, since Beijing hasn't shied away from using its economic leverage or flexing its military might at times to force states to take its preferences and account, uh, into account. But the point that Beijing is trying to make is that such a new type of international order would basically eliminate the need for alliances and blocs which Chinese leaders insist are vestiges of the Cold War, and which are basically a direct critique 
of the United States and its robust network of alliances around the world. Chinese leaders like to stress that because the world is populated with states that have all different political systems and religions and cultures, everyone should basically practice, practice what they call the principle of non-interference and focus on economic development instead which basically boils down to the proposition, let's get rich together while setting aside politics. Now this concept draws from China's own recent history in which it has reaped enormous benefits uh, by setting aside politics and foc focusing on eco economics. And this is precisely the type of neighborhood that the Chinese Communist Party finds safe, one in which no one has the right to question the legitimacy of its rule. Now, having said that, um, you may have seen a lot of headlines in recent, uh, recent months about you know, China and it's out to export authoritarianism and so on. Um, from my personal assessment, I don't think China is necessarily exporting its authoritarian model despite the dramatic headlines and reports we see in the papers. Rather, its willingness to pursue economic projects, often without robust standards for transparency or accountability, as well as its willingness to sell technology to anyone who will buy it, regardless of not of whether the client is an authoritarian state who might use this technology for repressive purposes, and its public diplomacy efforts that basically highlights uh, the successes of the Chinese and political, uh, economic and political model can reinforce non-democratic norms and practices around the world, especially in places where states are already leaning in that direction. So I think you know, there's, a, there's an important distinction there. China is not necessarily exporting or forcing its model onto others, but it, may, in, it is basically enabling authoritarianism, authoritarianism through what could be called a valueless approach to foreign policy, while at the same time shaping global norms by serving as an example of an economically <coughs> successful yet politically closed state. However, I don't think that China is out to forcefully remake the world in its own image, which is an important distinction to make. Now, Beijing has coupled its public diplomacy campaign with an economic strategy that seeks to uh, draw states into Chinese-led initiatives like the massive Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI, that I'm sure everyone here has heard of, which is basically about increasing opportunities for Chinese companies in far-flung locations as well as operationalizing China's pledge to bring prosperity to its economic powers. Now, China, unlike the United States, has not pitched itself as a regional security provider, but as an indispensable economic partner in regions both near and far from its borders. And many states, especially in the developing world, actually find this Chinese vision very attractive or necessary for their economic bottom lines. In fact, the Chinese message that poverty allevi alleviation and development, as opposed to political reform, must come first in order to have peace and stability, resonates deeply in places like Africa, where many states desperately seek de uh, development opportunities. Now finally, China's diplomatic and economic strategies are coupled with a security strategy that includes efforts to uh, increase the regional and global power projection capabilities of the PLA, the People's Liberation Army. Now there's been great interest in China's growing military capabilities over the last decade, and even more so in recent years with a renewed focus in Washington on the theme of great power competition. Beijing has not been shy about broadcasting its desire to become a world-class military power. Actually, since assuming power in 2012, President Xi has clearly articulated a vision to transform China into a full-fledged, world-class military power by 2050. And uh, a component of this so-called great, great Rejuvenation Project includes strengthening and expanding China's military capabilities. So the PLA has been tasked with all kinds of reforms and modernization goals to hit by 2035 and then to hit again by 2050. And just a few months ago, the PRC uh, celebrated its 70th anniversary of its founding, and this included a very flashy military parade that showcased a slew of sophisticated missiles and drones and advanced military aircraft. In addition, China has also vowed to become a strong maritime country, and it's increased its activities in the East and South China Seas. 
So since 2013, China uh, declared an air defense identification zone uh, in the East China Sea, where, it, where <coughs> its claims to territory overlaps with Japanese and South Korean claims. Um, and it has basically increased its naval and air presence in this area since then. In the South China Sea, as you probably have seen in the news, uh, China has also been building man-made islands in areas that, it, it, um, that other countries also claim, like Vietnam and the Philippines and so on. So these activities, as well as the character of its military expansion, generally indicate, um, however, that Beijing is primarily concerned about its military capabilities closer to home and protecting what it considers its core interests, such as preventing Taiwan from declaring independence, um, or protecting what it considers its sovereign territory in the East and South China Seas. But I think we'll have to watch as China's interests expand beyond its immediate neighborhood with its growing presence around the world, how exactly uh, it will grow its military footprint uh, to protect these interests. But I think it's important to note that, the, uh, that China is not necessarily rushing uh, to become a true military peer rival to the United States all around the world just yet. Uh, for instance, you know, there's been a lot of attention on Djibouti, where China built its first overseas military base in 2017. And there's been speculation that this base will be you know, only the first of many that are to come. And that is probably true. But it, I think it's important to note, so I actually took a trip out to Djibouti in November, and you know, what I'm hearing from folks on the ground, um, including our American officials on the ground, is that Djibouti, China is not necessarily in Djibouti with the aim of militarily dominating the African or Middle Eastern theater, theaters, but it's really there to pursue much narrower interests of protecting its citizens who are working in this region, protecting its economic projects, uh, maintaining or ensuring that the the maritime, there's maritime stability given the dependence on oil it has from this region, as well as to provide logistical support for its peacekeepers who are deployed around Africa. Um, so these are, you know, this is much more narrow of a, fo a narrow of a focus, and Chinese leaders are not necessarily interested in having a dominant military presence in every theater around the world or waging wars in far-flung locations. Again, they see economic engagement and economic dominance as their primary tool for influence and power. Now, if you had to pick the region where the risk of actual military confrontation between China and the United States is highest, I would say it is East Asia. This is China's immediate neighborhood where there are many long standing flashpoints from Taiwan to the East and South China Seas to the Korean Peninsula. Um, and I'm going to zoom in a bit on China's strategy in Northeast Asia, which is an area where I spend much of my time analyzing, and a great example of a place where both cooperation and competition uh, with China are absolutely critical uh, in order to promote regional stability. But this is also a theater where striking the right balance between cooperation and, and, um, and competition is, is incredibly difficult for the reasons I'll lay out. So to start out first with China's objectives in Northeast Asia. Basically, China seeks a Northeast Asian order in which it enjoys superi superiority across all dimensions and where it can freely protect its interests while retaining the support and respect of its neighbors. The three pillars of China's grand strategy that I just laid out earlier uh, take on a slightly different shape in this region. First, China's call for a uh, world free of alliances actually faces quite a high barrier in this particular region because the United States, two of the United States' most important allies, South Korea and Japan, are located in Northeast Asia. Um, it, China also faces barrier in this, uh, barriers in this region because most Northeast Asians, from the Japanese, the South Koreans, even the North Koreans, are actually very skeptical of Beijing's claims that it wants to be a different and better type of great power. In fact, if you look at polling data on global perceptions of China, Japan and South Korea often rank on sort of the most negative ends of the scale. And if you, if you were to conduct surveys in North Korea, I think you would find pretty much similar outcomes thanks to centuries of rivalry and mistrust in the region. In addition, China's economic strategy that seeks to draw states into Chinese-led initiatives like the Belt and Road Initiative um, also faces challenges in this part of the world. 
given that rather than being on the receiving end of Chinese development and infrastructure projects, Japan and, and South Korea are in many ways competitors in this space. So while Beijing has sought to uh, bring South Korea and Japan into BRI and to receive their endorsement and to pursue joint projects, Seoul and Tokyo have basically been hedging uh, with, one eye towards, uh, with one eye towards Washington, um, you know, being mindful of their ally. And there's, but at the same time, there's also a strong recognition in both capitals that shutting economic ties with China is an unrealistic option given China's enormous economic role in their region and beyond. North Korea, on the other hand, is theoretically a natural recipient state for BRI projects given its proximity to China, its low levels of development, and Beijing's strong interest in keeping this state afloat. However, Pyongyang has not been able to plug directly into BRI given all of the existing international sanctions uh, placed on the country. But this is not to say that there's a lot of interest in China as well as in South Korea and North Korea to jumpstart these sorts of projects and create economic corridors along the Korean Peninsula to China and all the way uh, uh, to Europe one day. But these types of projects are basically on hold at the moment with no progress in nuclear negotiations with North Korea. Now finally, while China, as I discussed, is not yet seeking military dominance all around the world, it certainly wants dominance in this immediate neighborhood. Um, and, and Northeast Asia is one place where Beijing uh, truly seeks supremacy, and has, it has demonstrated a willingness in the past to intervene in, uh, militarily, even when it came at a great cost. So to take the Korean Peninsula as an example, this is an arena where China um, intervened militarily in the past, as we saw 69 years ago, or 70 years ago now, when the PRC entered the Korean War in October 1950. Now this was not a decision that was made lightly, and it actually came at a horrible time for the Chinese Communist Party, given that, they, the, that the war broke out not even one year into establish, establishing their rule. But it's notable to, uh, to see that they were willing to intervene nonetheless, uh, to push back on what they saw as the United States getting too close to their border for comfort. Now, on the Korean Peninsula, China's primary objectives today include maintaining stability. It wants to prevent war. It is not seeking war, so I do want to be clear on that. And gradually rolling back the United States' presence while integrating North and South Korea into China's economic orbit. Now, I think one of the most interesting in, uh, relationships in this region is actually the China-North Korea relationship. So China, uh, China basically sees North Korea as a necessary ally despite their historically rocky relationship. And all of the headaches that North Korea has caused for uh, the PRC since the beginning of their relationship. Again, pulling China into war just when it had established its republic and bringing instability to its borders uh, with provocative behavior over the last two decades. However, uh, Chinese leaders have sought to keep Pyongyang closely aligned. They've basically shielded North Korea from international pressure, and, sir, and they've served as its primary patron for economic development and integration into the region. Although from time to time, Beijing has also played a critical role in prodding North Korea to come to the negotiating table. So for instance, in 2003, uh, we saw China stop its delivery of oil to North Korea in order to force it to join the six-party talks, which, try, which tried to deal with the North Korean nuclear program, but ultimately failed. And again, in 2017, China uh, basically signed on to increasingly tougher sanctions on North Korea at the UN Security Council, which had a large impact on North Korea's calculus um, as it was ramping up its nuclear and missile tests in late 2017. And these actions undoubtedly impacted Kim Jong-un's calculus to declare at the beginning of 2018 that he was ready to negotiate, that he would be willing to um, uh, declare the, his nuclear weapons program finished and basically focus on economic development. Now since Kim Jong-un's diplomatic outreach to the world, President Xi Jinping has met with the North Korean leader a total of five times. And these meetings were all timed to come right before and after Kim's summits uh, with the South Korean president as well as with President Trump. And they were basically intended to demonstrate uh, that China expects to play a role in any negotiations, 
that it, is, that it still wields great influence over North Korea, that it will not be sidelined, especially in any discussions about the future order of the Korean Peninsula. In recent months, however, China has not really been playing an active role in this space, um, and it hasn't really tried to breathe momentum in the impasse that's settled in between the United States and North Korea. And this is because Beijing has basically been consumed by the trade war with the United States, uh, with protests in Hong Kong, and, and now with this coronavirus. So basically, Beijing has uh, taken a back seat in the nuclear negotiations, signaling its interest and its intentions to be included, but not really taking uh, a leadership role. Today, I think Beijing is pretty comfortable with the fact that the United States and North Korea are still officially engaged in negotiations. Neither side have declared that, um, you know, that they won't talk to each other anymore. Although its level of comfort is probably decreasing as the impasse between the two countries continues. Um, and having negotiations break down, break down is clearly not in China's interest, since it could bring instability right to China's doorstep. Unfortunately, this calm may not last long, uh, however, uh, since the disappointment at the Hanoi summit in February last year, North Korea has again been ramping up its missile tests and it's been telling its citizens that you know, it may start, it's going to be you know, exploring new strategic weapons, that they should hunker down for a long period of struggle and economic hardship. Now, while we don't know whether North Korea will conduct a nuclear or ICBM, ICBM test anytime soon, there's a high probability that we may uh, revert back to a cycle of provocation, or that Pyongyang will revert back to a cycle of provocation in order to increase its leverage and until it senses another favorable time to come to the negotiating table. And we can very well imagine, in this case, a return to the threats of fire and fury between Pyongyang and Washington that we saw in late 2017. But even if we don't have such a dramatic deterioration in the situation, and negotiations are indefinitely, uh, were to indefinitely stall, the United States and its allies, South Korea and Japan, will likely face two competing demands in such a case. Uh, they are going to face the imperative to boost allied defense capabilities to counter the ever-expanding North Korean nuclear and conventional threat. Um, and, and Beijing, in turn, will see this as undermining its own security interests. At the same time, the US and its allies will also need to secure Chinese cooperation to bring Pyongyang back to the negotiating table. So there are two competing demands here. Now, if North Korea closes the door on negotiations for the short to midterm future, the United States and South Korea will probably scale up joint military exercises that have been modified or put on pause since the Singapore summit. Uh, there will probably be also a greater emphasis on boosting individual and joint missile defense capabilities. And there will be other measures to secure, uh, to strengthen their, there will be other measures to strengthen their individual and joint capabilities in response to North Korea's continued threat. Uh, in addition, with growing concerns about the Trump administration's commitment to the U.S.-South Korea alliance, there will also most likely be a push by segments of South Korean policy, the South Korean policymaking community for more visible signs of the United States' commitment. So we will likely see calls for the redeployment of U.S. tactical nuclear weapons to this region, um, or the creation of some kind of nuclear sharing pact akin to the NATO nuclear weapons sharing pact, in addition to calls within South Korea and Japan for their own indigenous nuclear capabilities, uh, which are becoming more and more mainstream, which is quite scary. Again, Beijing in turn will, develop, will view such developments unfavorably, given its ultimate objective of reducing, not increasing, the United States presence uh, in its backyard and rolling back the US-led alliance system in the region. It is likely to push back when it feels that measures adopted by the United States and its allies diminish its own military capabilities and unfavorably shift the regional balance of power, just as it did in the past. Um, and this will not only generate pressure on US allies, like South Korea, but it will also generate pressures within our alliances, um, and, and, and this is not good for us. Um, and also, rather than focusing on bringing North Korea back to the negotiating table, Beijing may actually choose to focus on, again, pressuring allies and, uh, to reduce their cooperation with the United States. So to mitigate against these sorts of challenges, it'll be imperative 
to clearly set expectations with Beijing in advance that if the United States and its partners want China's cooperation on North Korea, they would rather not have to take such measures, but they will have no choice but to strengthen their defense, defensive capabilities as long as uh, the North Korean nuclear and missile threat remains unchecked. And I think demonstrating inner alliance resolve on these issues will be key to convincing Beijing that working with Washington, Seoul, and Tokyo to rein in North Korea will be a faster and more effective route to safeguarding its own security interests. Now I want to move on to some of the major challenges that China faces in its quest to become a great power. Um, despite the significant internal and external efforts it's made to expand both its military capabilities as well as its economic presence around the world. First, China faces major international, uh, internal challenges from the need to engage in structural economic reform to struggles to exert control over territories like Hong Kong, Tibet, and Xinjiang, uh, and to build the capacity to deal with unexpected challenges like this recent coronavirus outbreak that has become a huge test for the Chinese, Chinese Communist Party. But even before the viral outbreak, uh, Beijing has been facing disgruntlement among its citizens over issues such as economic inequality, bureaucratic mismanagement, and even air pollution at the grassroots level, all of which could potentially lead to instability in China's domestic political arena. Now, while Beijing clearly understands that these challenges exist and it has tried to deal with them in various ways, uh, many of these issues cannot be resolved overnight and can certainly distract or slow down Beijing's efforts to transform into a true great power. In addition to these internal challenges, China also faces severe limitations in terms of hard and soft power uh, abroad, especially compared to the United States. So other than a treaty of mutual aid and cooperation with North Korea and some strategic partnership labels here and there, China has no formal alliances and it just has one overseas military base, again in Djibouti. In contrast, the United States has dozens of allies, dozens of collective defense arrangements and security partnerships and bases throughout the world. Now these alliances are an invaluable asset that enable the United States to generally uh, to impact uh, outcomes in the global arena. Um, and because it's a primary security partner for numerous countries in East Asia and beyond, beyond, the United States receives lots of strategic benefits, including its allies' willing, will, allies willingness to consult, coordinate, and adjust their policies to accommodate U.S. interests, or at the very least, keep the United States informed on any decisions of consequence. Our allies also provide access to foreign bases that allow the United States to be present uh, far and wide. They also contribute troops and political support for various U.S. endeavors. While China has used its economic offerings as its primary way to win the same kind of influence with others, um, and while many countries, as I said, welcome Chinese economic investment and trade, there are also pervasive fears of Chinese overreach and exploitation, which has sparked uh, grassroots protests and the abrogation of certain BRI projects around the world. Uh, for instance, several infrastructure projects in Myanmar, Nepal, and Pakistan um, have all been suspended or canceled in recent years in light of public pressure and complaints of Chinese colonization. Uh, these cases demonstrate that even states with relatively close ties to Beijing and a genuine desire for economic aid will not necessarily accept Chinese investment in the face of domestic resistance and sovereignty concerns. <coughs> Finally, China also really lags behind in the soft power realm. So again, if you see polls um, around the world, you know, states by and large tend to say that they believe that having the United States as opposed to China as the world's leading power is better for their interests. Uh, and again, this is most pronounced in East Asia, closest to China's borders. Um, and I think this is, uh, this is due to the fact that many East Asians have uh, struggled with Chinese domination in past centuries. They don't want to live under <coughs> Beijing's shadow. And in large part, also because the United States democratic political system um, our, our respect for individual freedoms and the rule of law resonate deeply in countries like South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, 
And even inside China, where many elites and citizens are al alike are disturbed by the increasingly authoritarian turn of their government. Even further afield from China's borders in places like Africa, where many leaders and citizens tend to have much more positive views of China, um, they still you know, emphasize that they appreciate the United States system. Many leaders when you, and experts on the ground, when you talk with them, they say, you know, if I could choose, I would rather choose to study in the United States as opposed to China. And you know, many of these publics still gravitate towards American cultural offerings as well. So given this context, I think the United States should have, should have confidence in its ability to manage competition with China. Uh, but it's also important to remember that while the United States leadership is welcomed and favored around the world, these positive views should not be taken for granted, and that it takes hard work to maintain and strengthen um, our greatest assets, whether it's our democratic system um, or our alliances and partnerships around the world. Now let me conclude by advancing a three-part recommendation on how the United States should manage strategic competition with China going forward, which involves one, equipping allies and partners to manage China's growing presence around the world, two, strengthening our alliances and coordinating with our allies to deter China from engaging in destabilizing behavior and encourage it to engage in positive behavior instead, and three, finding ways to co cooperate with China in areas of mutual concern. Now going to the first recommend, uh, recommendation, in recent years, Washington has been very strident in warning countries around the world, especially developing ones, that they should be wary of China's BRI because these projects lack transparency, they're not always the highest quality, and they may come with political strings attached. Now what you hear over and over from developing states however, is that they don't really have the luxury to reject incoming investment, and they are eager to seize these opportunities even if they're not perfect. Um, so rather than simply lecturing states, I think it's important that the United States recognizes that Chinese economic investment and, um, and economic activity is here to stay. It can make a great competition if it, a contribution if it's done right, um, and that it's actually better, rather than asking people to reject Chinese investment, to help build capacity in these states so that state leaders and citizens can have the ability to scrutinize these projects and demand for greater standards, greater quality, and greater transparency. Um, and so this is somewhere where I think we should really be focused. Um, and, and there has been movement to do more of this. For instance, you may have heard of the BUILD Act, which created the, the Development Finance Corporation in the United States that will basically encourage U.S. companies to go abroad and to do more work in the developing world. So hopefully this will increase the choices that states have, and by increasing the choices and increasing the competition, raise standards altogether. Um, there's also been uh, lots of funding given to USAID and the State Department to do capacity building uh, to, to train next generation leaders, to send lawyers to help scrutinize various contracts that are coming in from China, and I think these are all great things. On the second recommendation on maintaining and strengthening our alliances, I think it's important that Washington doesn't make it see, uh, doesn't ask our allies to choose between the United States and China. Uh, what is very clear, if you talk to people throughout, uh, you know, throughout Asia and around the world, no one wants to be enlisted in a new Cold War against China. And most of these worlds, including the United, uh, most of these countries, including the United States, actually count on China as one of their largest, if not uh, most important, trade partners. And so it's vital that the U.S. government demonstrates to our allies and partners that we're not, you know, trying to enlist them or use them as chips. Uh, in a competition with China, but that we value our relationships for their own sake. Now, unfortunately, the United States alliances, especially in East Asia, are undergoing extreme challenges right now. For instance, South Korea and the U.S. are locked in contentious negotiations over cost sharing uh, in the U.S. ROK alliance. And the U.S.-Japan alliance will also be facing uh, challenging negotiations in a few months. Uh, but besides these immediate disagreements, many U.S. allies and partners also have various concerns um, that range on one extreme from fears that the United States will not honor its uh, alliance commitments and withdraw from its region, 
and there are actions that have, uh, that have been going on in recent years to encourage these fears, to anxiety on the other extreme, that be, they'll be dragged into a war between the United States and China over, uh, because of an overzealous approach to great power competition. So in the midst of these kinds of concerns, I think candid dialogue, reassurance, and close coordination with our allies are critical for maintaining these partnerships that really are our country's, uh, one of our country's greatest assets. And finally, I'd say that while it's vital to signal to Beijing that the United States and its allies uh, will, will not tolerate destabilizing behavior, it's also just as vital to reassure Chinese leaders and the Chinese people that the United States does not seek to keep China down because a disgruntled, disgruntled and isolated China would be just as destabilizing, if not more, than one that it is confidently uh, engaged in the global arena. So I think as the competitive aspect of, US, of the U.S.-China relationship grows, it'll become even more important to double down and invest in the cooperative aspect of the relationship as well. A U.S.-China engagement will be vital for preventing escalation in the bilateral relationship, finding di diplomatic solutions to the many outstanding conflicts that we have, as well as seizing opportunities to work together on press pressing issues like climate change, and denuclearizing North Korea, which cannot be solved without China's active participation. So let me leave it there, and I will look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. And I'm going to focus actually on the China portion. So in, a, in an era of growing competition between the United States and China, official level dialogue is becoming more and more difficult. And even Track 1.5 dialogues are becoming more and more difficult these days. So I think in this sort of environment, it's absolutely, absolutely important that we keep up people-to-people -people exchanges. Um, that we, so that we can understand each other, so that the goodwill between the Chinese people and the American people don't go away. I think deeper, more nuanced understandings of the other side always serve as a good check against escalating tensions, and, and we really need to have that here. Uh, USIP has actually tried to contribute in this space by hosting Chinese students. We hope to do more dialogues between Chinese and American students. Um, there are many other ways you can engage, you know, you can think about sister cities, uh, regional and, and, and uh, national level partnerships and so on. And I think another way that individuals can play a role is really um, in, uh, uh, in being careful of living out our values. So there's been a lot of concern about Chinese students or Chinese scientists who are stealing, you know, there's been sort of this narrative that um, you know, there are many, many Chinese students or scientists who are here to conduct espionage. And I think these sorts of sweeping characterizations are very dangerous. And we as individuals have a role to play in making sure that these sorts of characterizations don't get out of hand. That we welcome Chinese students here and we really make an important part of our society. Um, and I think, you know, just, just really living up to our values can go a long way. Much more than military and economic offerings, really and showing the world um, and, and ensuring that you know, we, we maintain good relations with China. Well said. I, if I can add, uh, we received a direct appeal from the Chinese government to uh, our organization 
for medical protective supplies. That's how urgent the need is, and we are doing all we can to, to support that need. Because we, we feel very strongly that if they see us reaching out a hand of support at such a critical time, that will be well <coughs> uh, The second question concerns uh, what you discussed in great detail, the Belt and Road Initiative. If I could modify the question slightly, is as China goes through this massive Belt and Road system all over the world, at some point, they're going to run out of countries to go to and uh, investments to make. Uh, how do you see the ultimate objective? Is it really to create lily pods along the way, reaching all the way into England, potentially? Uh, so I think China is a long way off from running out of countries and running out of projects to pursue. I mean, the BRI is massive, uh, but it still doesn't cover all, you know, all of the world. And Chinese, China is just you know very eager to, to, to strike partnerships all around the world, whether it's in, um, in Europe or Latin, Latin America. And you know, what are Chinese intentions behind this? Well, as I said, I mean, BRI first and foremost is about uh, creating economic opportunities for Chinese companies to do business abroad. Um, it's, it's also, as I said, you know, China living up to its promise that it, could, that it will become, it'll be a partner who will do win-win cooperation, that can bring development projects, that can bring prosperity to other parts of the world. Now, having said that, I think there are a lot of mixed views on BRI. So there's a lot of enthusiasm, um, where you know a lot of developing countries say we actually love this investment, we need this infrastructure, we want to work with China. But at the same time, there are concerns. You know, some of these projects are not the most transparent; they're not high quality, and so on. And so there's a the mixed picture. And again, as I said in my recommendations, um, it's important that we help these countries manage, not necessarily you know keep China out, but actually manage China's growing presence in their countries. Thank you. Uh, turning back to coronavirus, uh, perhaps the greatest threat China has faced in a very long time. Two scenarios, they, they are going to extraordinary lengths to control it. What happens if they don't? Does this have a direct reflection on the authority and the power of the central government? Yeah, so the coronavirus um, is Obviously, it's, you know, we still have to watch and see how damaging uh, the impact of this viral outbreak will be and how far it will spread and how it will impact uh, the ultimately the Chinese Communist Party. Um, hopefully, it is contained soon, but I think it's very clear that there is a strong economic impact. You know, I've seen various numbers of how this will cut into China's growth for forecast. Um, and this is coming at a time when uh, Chinese economic growth is actually at the lowest in 30, de uh, 30 years. Um, so it's already not a great time for China. Um, and this is not just impacting China, but it also impacts international companies that are doing business with China. So I understand, Lauren, you represent some of these uh, you know, companies who need supplies from China. So you know, companies like Hyundai and Apple and so on are, are stopping their production because they need parts from China and these aren't coming in. Um, also, companies like Starbucks or Disneyland or Disney, you know, who rely on Chinese consumers, they're also having to scale back on their operations. So there's really a global economic impact. Um, so that is concerning, obviously, for Chinese leaders as well as business um, leaders around the world. Uh, I think another very concerning aspect for the Chinese government, you know, for Xi Jinping sitting in Beijing, is what impact will this have on my leadership? And um, there has been a lot of criticism you know, coming out of China that the Chinese government has not been the most transparent um, or you know, that it's been basically repressive of information. Uh, you know, there was a big story about eight doctors who initially discovered this coronavirus in December and they were basically uh, repressed. Uh, the, the, the authorities were afraid that if they, you know, they weren't, they basically repressed their social media postings and so on to spread the word. And one of the doctors who was part of this eight um, actually died about several days ago and there was outpourings of grief. And so I think what worries Beijing the most is if this criticism elevates from a local and regional level to the national level and questions about its um, political legitimacy. Um, and so that's what, you know, what keeps people up in Beijing at night. We'll have to see how they handle um, the coronavirus, but it's you know, very much a developing situation. Yes, yes it is. Back to North Korea. Um, 
It's a little country that makes an awful lot of noise. Uh, how, when we see President Kim, what is with this guy? I don't know what to put it is. is uh, what do we make of him? He, he was, uh, went to school in Europe. Uh, he's a mystery. Uh, I, I modified the question, so it's just, how do we look at him, but what do we think about this guy? Well, you know, I would hate to be him. It's a very difficult position. Um, he assumed leadership you know, at a very young age. Uh, you think that he is the great chairman in North Korea, but that can't be a secure position. You know, there are obviously different factions in North Korea, even though you know, Kim Jong-un is sort of this overwhelming presence. There are inevitably political factions below him, and so uh, for him, it's, it's a tough position to be in. Uh, he came into power promising his people that, you know, that he would bring quick economic development, you know, that they would soon be rich and enjoying all kinds of luxuries, and he hasn't been able to deliver. And so he's in a very tight spot. Um, and you know, it's very interesting when you look at the China-North Korea relationship that I talked about during the lecture. Um, so China, Xi Jinping, you know, there's a lot of anecdotes about how Xi Jinping actually can't stand Kim Jong-un. And they actually never met each other, or they, you know, they, they never had any exchanges after Xi became president and after Kim Jong-un uh, assumed his leadership in 2011 until after 2018 when Kim Jong-un came out onto the world stage and said, okay, I'm ready to talk to everyone. Um, and so until then, China was actually downplaying their alliance and saying, oh, you know, we don't really have an alliance. We, we are just normal country to country uh, friends and, and so on. Uh, but as soon as uh, Kim Jong-un, or as soon as Chairman Kim said that he was willing to diplomatically engage, I think this sparked something that's something that they've been wanting for years. They want North Korea to become a stable, authoritarian regime that is, uh, you know, is doing business and um, is not going to crumble on their borders. Um, so it's very interesting to watch this relationship. So much, you know, so much to cover, really. Indeed. And with that, with our remaining time, we'd like to invite the audience to pose uh, any questions. Uh, I can see a hand in the back here. Uh, yeah. He's fixing it right here. Thank you. So um, my question is, so I, I watch a lot of CSIS and stuff, and they got all these seminars and all these experts. I found, I found they never really mentions about the current left and right struggles within China, especially on social media. Uh, as how I see it, myself being a communist, is that um, China is now like the ideology within the people is splitting between the right wing more nationalistic and they're getting more and more aggressive and the right the and the left wing being communistic, socialistic, anarchist. And the struggle is like uh, it's the, the divide is so deep that you know in many cases there's no um, like normal conversation between these two sort of factions online. And I wonder how do you guys see it? Whether, because uh, I see it as like maybe in the future China will either turn into a fascist country if the right wings actually get into power, or a more communistic, socialistic country if the left wing, you know, eventually got more support and power. Uh, and uh, because also you know having this huge um, China being capitalistic for so long and having such a huge divide uh, between the rich and the poor, the, pro the proletarian and the bourgeoisie. Um, the society is really under a lot of stress and conflict, and you know, there's only really two ways out, as I have, uh, as I see it, you know, nationalism or communism. So that's actually a very interesting observation, and I actually see more a combination of those two. So I think there has been a growing nationalism that has been combined with uh, an effort, especially since Xi Jinping's presidency, to bring more communist ideology um, together. And he sees that as his means to sort of, um, that, uh, you know, that's been Xi's strategy for trying to rally folks together. Um, did, you, did you want to ask a follow-up? Uh, yes, uh, I see the, uh, the idea of Xi being more like Mao Zedong as a big misconception. 
uh, <laughs> sorry, like, because I saw that a lot on Western media, but as me and other Chinese left wing sees it, she is actually more right wing as we see it. He's like, he's trying to restore uh, Confucianism within China, uh, more focus on traditional ideology, conservatism, and, uh, and it, there's no part of his policy that, as we see it, is more socialistic than any of his predecessors or anything. So I really don't understand, because he's probably more authoritarian, but authoritarian is in no way communistic or socialistic. Right, so I think Xi Jinping is basically, you, know, you see a, a return to perhaps communism by name and stressing ideal, ideology and party unity and so on. And so perhaps that's a little bit different from the communism that you are referring to. Um, but, you know, when I hear from my uh, friends on the ground in China, they're actually, you know, many of the elites and academics are actually very disturbed by this ideological turn inside Beijing uh, or inside China. Um, you know, a lot of people are feeling like they have less room to have debate and to speak up. Um, and, you know, I remember somebody was showing me a video of their kindergartner who was watching ideological, you know, sort of party propaganda videos in the kindergarten. So, uh, you know, so folks are, you know, very concerned with this and, and I think we'll have to watch and see where, where, where this goes and whether this, make, this puts the CCP in a better position or not. Many hands, many hands. Uh, We'll take this uh, gentleman right here, and then we'll move to the, the center back. How, how does the United States and, and the Western world in general uh, achieve a mutually productive relationship with China when China seems bent on not abiding by the rules of international trade and economic relationships? I mean, I've had personal experience trying to deal with China, and, and it, they're so blatant, at least in my dealing with them, they were so blatant in their attempts to steal intellectual property. Uh, they seem to be an ongoing effort to, through cyber tactics, to steal intellectual property, uh, subsidizing state industries. I don't understand how the U.S. and the Western world can achieve a mutually beneficial relationship with China if it continues to exhibit those behaviors? Well, the first, uh, the phase one trade deal between the United States and China, you know, part of the, the efforts was to, to address exactly that, to crack down on um, IPR theft, uh, to make, you know, Ch to make China more open for foreign businesses and so on, and there were other components. But anyways, we, there have been many attempts to deal with this. And I think, you know, as you say, there, it's, it's tough. You know, we don't see eye to eye with China everywhere. Uh, but there are certain, certain areas, I think especially uh, IPR, where China's interests will actually merge with our assumed. So they're becoming much more technologically advanced and, um, and they're, they're filing patents at um, an astonishing rate. And there will be a day when China wants to protect those as well. And it's actually in their self-interest. So I think looking for the areas of mutual interest first and working from those, uh, that perhaps that's one way to do it. But yes, we don't see eye to eye on everything. There is certainly concern about espionage, there's concern about cyber intrusions and so on. And so there are tough issues and we need to work on it in our bilateral relationship. Uh, to your point, uh, this, we were at the US Embassy in Beijing talking to their IPR uh, staff and the, they, they said something that astonished me is that for every one case of China stealing US IP, there are 20 cases of Chinese on Chinese theft of IP. Is that they're going after each other as aggressively, if not more so, than anyone else. And he said the courts are full of cases, which are just China-China cases internally, which I found surprising. Uh, not much of a really granted, but uh, just an interesting fact that uh, there's an aggression internally that we seldom see. Uh, there's a gentleman back here, sir. You were the next one in line, so with the distinguished white hair, if I can put it that way. Yes, sir. What is the uh, cur current status of the Chinese plans to uh, build a canal across Nicaragua? 
So I have not been following that at all, so I'm going to have to pass on that one. And answer, Joe, in front. Um, how many girls have been aborted in China? Um, is that practice slowed or continuing of uh, preferring boys to girls? And what's that demographic gap going to be? How is that going to work its way through the system? Sure. Uh, so the, the question was about uh, the demographic gap between boys and girls and also how many girls have been aborted in China. So I haven't been following uh, the statistics lately, um, but there is, you know, there is a uh, male-female ratio gap. And this was you know, due to a one-child policy where, you know, state, where families could only have one child and often they prefer boys to girls. But this policy has actually been abolished since, do you know which year? Uh, I want to say this was four or five years ago. Yeah, four or five years ago. And so um, you know, people can have as many children as they want, have as many children as they want now. And I think the norms are changing as well. Um, but, I, but there is a gender gap. I don't know what the exact percentage is. But I think it's it is mitigating, you know, or should mitigate over time with this change in policy. Is that going to affect the future and has the birth rates reflected? Uh, well, sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, dramatically, for several reasons, because there is a, a distinct imbalance. It also goes to culture. Is that within China is to marry within a cultural or economic social group, and there's a large group, something like 25 to 40 million Chinese men that are of a, of a lower social status are having a terrible time trying to find a wife. Mm -hmm. Terrible time. Coupled with the fact that people are not having, young people are not having many children. Uh, they have pets. And I know that because in our industry, pet supplements are the hottest <laughs> thing in China. <laughs> and they, they spend tons of money to keep their little dogs and cats healthy. And they're a lot cheaper than kids, a lot less of a headache, and it's a, it's a fundamental shift in thinking, which uh, is a big deal, because if the birth rate in China continues to drop, as it is, uh, you look at the economic significance of that, it's enormous. Enormous. Uh, gentleman over here, right next to the mic. Uh, yes, I'd like to uh, return uh, to the issue of people-to-people uh, -people exchange. It seems uh, in the history of U.S.-China higher education exchange, uh, just in recent years, we started to get a few uh, senior people, uh, or people that have studied in the United States into se senior positions in the uh, Chinese government, such as uh, the chief trade negotiator, Leo He is a member of the Politburo, and Wang Huning, who's the uh, propaganda uh, chief in the uh, Standing Committee of the Politburo. How much effect do you think their time in the United States uh, will have, will influence them on being able to resolve issues peacefully and, uh, uh, you know, in an expeditious manner with the United States? That's a really interesting question. It would be a great study to undertake to sort of trace these high-level leaders who have been trained here in the U.S and gone back to China and see what kind of impact that has. I mean, just generally speaking, I'm sure that it helps with cultural understanding. Obviously, it helps with language. You know, I don't know if it, if it makes it more amenable to the United States or not. Um, and I'm sure it depends, case by case, depending on the individual. Uh, but I think it is, it really says something that these high-level leaders like to come to study in the US President Xi sent his daughter to study in Harvard. Many Chinese elites still very much aspire to come here. And I think, you know, maintaining those, those ties, you know, it should have a positive effect. Although in, on an individual case-by-case -case basis, it's hard to tell. Uh, Ma'am, right here. I'm curious that you didn't, Your mic's there. That you didn't mention the Pacific Trade Agreement and what happened with the ratifications of not So you're talking about the TPP, right? Yes. Yes, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, which was basically a, a large treaty. It's turned into the CT, I can never remember that name, CT. In any case, it's, it's revived without the United States and Japan in lead. And actually, you know, many Asian countries, especially our allies, had eagerly seen this as a way to increase 
U.S. economic involvement in the East Asian theater. Um, and uh, for you know, domestic political reasons, the United States withdrew. But I think this had, um, and there are various arguments out there whether this was good or not for, for, um, for the American public. But in terms of maintaining our alliances, it certainly you know, was a blow to people who were, who were counting on the U.S. to be there. Um, and I don't know, you know if there's prospects of, of the United States joining this newly revamped version. Um, it's not very popular in Washington, um, and so we'll have to see. But I think you know, it goes to the fact that the U.S. really needs to think about comprehensive engagement. We don't want to just be doing military things. We don't want to just be in the diplomatic space. We also want to be in the economic space. And, and you know, to compete with China, you need to be there comprehensively. And so you know, trade packs like the TPP could have been one way to do that. So if I'm understanding you and reading between the lines, you were, you're thinking it would have been a great idea. And you're disappointed that it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to say it. Okay. You are I, 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 I have actually testified on the Hill uh, that it would have been great for us to pursue these sorts of trade agreements, but of course, you know, there are also domestic political realities as well, so, you know, our leaders are juggling a lot. Uh, yes, gentlemen, uh, sorry? Yes, sir. Oh, uh, okay, I have a microphone, but thank you for le your lecture, it was really good, I really I enjoyed it. Uh, you had spoke about like, uh, your recommendations like to um, limit China for from uh, having a you say destabilized behavior in other countries. Uh, why was uh, what do you mean by stabilized behavior? And second question is why um, what was why there was no reaction to the destabilizing behavior that European countries had, like in North Africa, or why was destabilizing not an issue when? Um, the U.S. when its own countries and the uh, emptiness of power or leadership. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I mean, I am not going to dispute you there that China is certainly not the only destabilizing actor, you know, and all countries have destabilizing behaviors. The, the theme of the lecture was on how do we manage Chinese, our competition with China, how do we manage China's growing presence, and so in terms of destabilizing behavior, for instance, um, just to think of one example. So China, um, uh, for, in, for the East China Sea or the South China Sea, where China has really ramped up its activities to try to claim land that many others also claim, you know, those are the types of behaviors that, that hopefully we can work with our allies to show that we're not, you know, that there are certain red lines that we want you to, to not uh, try to assert your sovereignty militarily, but rather you know, sit down diplomatically and so on. And so you need to have these alliances in place where we can signal together to China. That's what I meant. We have time for one more question, so I'll let you call on the last person. Um, yes, ma'am. Um, actually, wow. <laughs> uh, thanks for your talk, I appreciate it. Um, you said they want to trade just to trade. I don't want to talk about anything more devious than that. Do they, do they have any expansionism? I mean, they seem to be migrating through Southeast Asia. You could subtly take countries just by money and even people. There's a lot of people moving around from China through Southeast Asia. And secondly, are they buying up resources and land in places like Africa? Where, you know, what are they doing with their money to grab parts of the world and other power besides just China? Um, so I never said that China is trading just to trade. I said that China's, um, China sees economic influence as its means to assert its power, to assert, uh, to have influence around the world, to shape outcomes. And so it very much sees economics as opposed to military power in the, in the way the U.S. does, um, as a means to win friends and allies around the world. Now, in terms of is China, you know, extracting resources, buying a property, I mean, yes, but so are many other countries. Um, and so, you know, China relies, or China is very interested in Africa for all sorts of resources, but so are, 
so are European countries, so is the United States. And so I think it's not a question of are they out there to you know, grab all the resources, but re really can they do it sustainably? Can we all do it sustainably and in a way that benefits the countries that are exporting these goods? I think that's the question. And with that, we want to thank you, Dr. Kim, for a very informative and useful lecture. With, uh...